Okay, good morning. Uh, my name is Gary Matsoka, and we're here at Laguna Hills Nursery in Santa Ana <coughs> on a Saturday morning. And today's class is our one of our big ones for the year. It's on avocados and how to grow them. So I would tell you, I probably know a little more about growing avocados than the varieties themselves. I haven't eaten all the ones that we sell. So, uh, and that's, you know, we're getting new ones pretty much every year. So we don't know all of them yet. We know quite a few of them, but we don't know all of them. And I haven't grown uh, an orchard of trees, although I walked through an orchard of avocado trees uh, for the last three or four years. I've, I've seen what they are doing there. So we know them uh, better and better, but that's not my field of expertise. But we are, but we feel experts on how to grow plants and avocados are one of the more difficult plants to grow. In fact, I forgot to bring, be right back, I forgot to bring my little avocado in here. Okay, sorry about that. Um, so we got close to 1,600 of these in this week. And just so you know how fast they can grow, this is a gem. This is a gem from one year ago that was this big. So that's what we expect them to do. So you can see that, uh, you know, put on maybe five feet. Um, usually they have about three growth spurts per year. The first growth spurt, we get to a five gallon size. The second one, we get to a 15 gallon size, and then we get the box. So they can do that in a year. This one would sell for around 400. This one for around 180. These for about 70, and these are 37 right now so you can save what uh, quite a bit of money if you just grow your own so we'll tell you how to grow them um, so some of them have you know not one so they're what the growers do is around oh the tags we get on these one says this is a zutano pit that they they planted let it grow until August or September or October, cut the tops off, and then graft on a short branch of this tree. It was about this long when they grafted it, and then this grew. And then we get them. So this was grafted roughly, what, six, seven months ago. <clears throat> um, now this is nice because it's got a definite central one stem ones like this you know you can you can see that they sprouted sideways so this one um i'm not sure which one sprouted first uh but you know the one at the top of this little scion here this little stem that was originally grafted the one at the top usually is more dominant i don't like to cut off the side ones um and only because they will fruit. <laughs> the one in the center generally doesn't fruit. The ones that grow to the sides fruit. So it's nice to keep what you can on the tree, uh, especially when they're this young. Don't cut them off. Just let them grow. Now, the exception of that would be if the one at the very top of the stem is smaller and the ones on the sides are longer. What we notice is that if I make one of the side ones and stake that up, sometimes the one at the top of the stem eventually starts growing and becomes the central leader. Uh, and this side one that I trained up doesn't do it anymore. 
So in that case, sometimes I'll cut off the top one that's small and just use the side one. But, you know, again, there's no rules on avocado trees. You don't have to have just one trunk. You can have several trunks. It's just when we sell them, they look better in the pots with just one trunk staked up. And it takes up less room in our store, too. So, Okay, to plant these guys... So we do recommend putting them in a small black five-gallon bucket for the first three or four months. Some people will tell us, well, will it take a year? No, it just takes three or four months to get it up to size. Um, and during that time, the nice thing about black plastic is this is going to be definitely warmer in the sun than the ground is for the next three or four months. This will be warmer in here. They'll actually, we think they'll actually grow faster in black plastic than they will in the ground. Plus, in the ground... If you're not careful, these things are so small, you know, a pet or a, or a rodent or something it can destroy it. And you can with one step of your foot. So it's better to keep them mobile. Now, we're not expecting frost this winter, but if they say it's going to drop below, say, 42 or 40 at night, just bring it under protection on your house or on a porch or something. And the other reason we like to put them in black plastic is because one out of every 100 or 120 or so uh, doesn't grow right. And we think it's the genetics of the pit. So every, every avocado pit has got different genetics. And most of them are fine. Some grow a little faster than normal. Some grow a little slower than normal. But now and then we get one that's just an off, you know, must be an off pit because they're all the same tops. <clears throat> but... We get some that grow for a while, then just turn ugly and just sit there and never grow. So if we get one of those, we're not going to sell it. And if you get one of those, you know, if you had to be real unlucky, you know, that's like one or two percent, uh, and you have one in your pot that's just not growing well, don't plant it. Don't waste your time planting it. You get another one. But we have a few that, like this one, just turn it off color. It doesn't look healthy. Now this is an interesting one here in that this is two years, this is the same age as, well this is two years older, so it's a year older than that. It never grew. It looks totally healthy, it just won't grow. But it's fruiting and the leaves look fine. I mean, generally if the leaves look small and pale or a small and brown tip, you know they have no roots. But this one, the leaves look totally healthy, it's totally blooming, it's setting fruit. And it hasn't grown more than six inches, seven inches since we got it. So there's something with the genetics of this rootstock or the seed root on this is telling it to be a dwarf tree. So some get really weird. I mean, someone wanted to buy this, so we sold it to them. But you know, that's going to be a patio avocado. So, so anyway, when we plant these... And also, you know, one of the things that you get told a lot is don't overwater avocados. They hate water. They hate it wet. I mean, everybody's done this. You grow an avocado pit in a glass of water, the sitting water doesn't hurt them. I mean, we water these freely. I mean, when we plant them up, if they look dry at all, we just water them. There's, there's no, you know, they come from uh, central Mexico, Guatemala, or where there's a lot of wet seasons, really wet seasons, just as wet as our season is this year. Um, and it's not the water that's hurting them. <clears throat> the problem we have is that all other growers of avocados, other than what we get in here, I mean, this we think is perfect, peat moss, perlite, it can sit in water, it's not gonna, be, it's not gonna rot. But any other larger avocado you buy is in compost from any other nursery, it's in compost, ground up wood of some sort, or we've seen coconut core, and that's freshly dead plant material that's trying to rot. And if you keep it moist at all, it's rotting. And as it's rotting, it can take out your avocado roots at the same time, because that's what its job is, is to, is to decompose plant material. And if your avocado happens to be living in it, then it can decompose it also. Now, we know that avocados growing in compost, if they're surrounded by perfectly draining soil, real sandy, airy soil, they can make it and do well. But you're surrounded by, if you have something in compost surrounded by clay, it just rots, it just rots. 
and it's not the water that's causing it it is the compost so anyway so these we get we consider these are in perfect condition uh, put them in our soil they'll remain in perfect condition so our our top pot potting soil has nothing that's capable of rotting very quickly I mean it does have peat moss peat moss rots really slowly but it's not related to anything that we're trying to grow uh, so when we want to get these into these pots now this bag used to be enough to fill this I don't know if they're filling the bags as much as they used to so usually what we do when you plant these we'll put about three or four inches in at the bottom to get the height right I mean you can just place the avocado in there and see how so you want, I want the top of the seat to go about equal to the top rim of the pot because this should stick out of the ground a little bit. I mean, if you bury it, it's not a big deal. Um, and then to get these out, a nice sharp box cutter. Now, I was told there are zippers on these things, places where they tear easier, but I can't find them reliably, so I just usually... You get a box cutter, start at the bottom, real light cut all the way to the top. And just take it out like that. This is how Brokar supplier who grafts these uh, identifies a tree. This yellow stick that's, uh, identifies it as a gem. I don't know if this tree still has this little stick. Yeah, I did. It's still there. Ooh, system looks good. Set it in there. And then add the rest of the soil around the sides. Now our larger bag will fill a little more than two pots of this size. I like to use the totally clean pot and I ordered 300 of them this week and my supplier said they just sold out. <laughs> so I won't get them till they had a shipment come in after dark last night so on Monday we'll try to get some more of these. Now if you get a dirty five gallon just try to clean it real well because you don't know if something rotted in here before. That's the only thing if it's a used five gallon now, if you want to sterilize it, uh, choices are boiling water, but, you know, the safest way is 10% uh, bleach. I mean, uh, a torch will do it, too. <laughs> you know, you can, you can cook it. I mean, my friend who was in the uh, plant starting business, he, they would use the same sand over and over again, and they would just put the sand in a huge oven. They get it hot, and then they sterilize it that way. Anyway, so, well, looks like we have enough soil, so we just pack it around the sides of this so it doesn't move. And you can tap it. That'll get it settled a bit, too. And now you can see that it's the seed is still sticking up a bit. I got a couple inches of room to put water in there. Uh, then we like, I like to stake it next. Now again, you don't have to stake it. It doesn't have to be retail perfect in your yard, but it looks better for us to stake them. Try not to uh, compromise the root ball that you just stuck in there. Now, one other reason we like to plant them up as soon as we can if you leave this out in the sun, the sun hits it right here and it's uh, 80 degrees that day, it's going to be 100 degrees in there and you're going to burn up a whole bunch of roots. So, uh, you know, try not to expose this to full sun, on a, especially on a warm day, warmer than, say, 75 or approaching 80. It just gets hot in there. Then tying this up. 
You can use twist ties when they're this small. We have a lot of these three foot stakes. Now in you know in two months this stake will be too short. It's about like that. And then we like to put two kinds of fertilizer on it. We like the Osmocote because it's a time release. I mean, when I was a kid, my dad told me, okay, you water plants every day, you fertilize them once a month. We don't have time to go through all our plants and fertilize them once a month like they did in the old days. So this will last six months or at least five. And we like to put about this much. This is about two tablespoons. I think it's two tablespoons. I think this is a one ounce of that and then also something with the mycorrhizal fungus so there are several products all the dock earth products whether or not it says fruit tree all-purpose rose life they have the mycorrhizal fungus in here which are the symbiotic partners to the plant roots i don't know if roca does it i haven't really asked the production manager if they add the mycorrhizal fungus um, of the down earth products, there's a few of these on the shelf that have mycorrhizal. This one that says tree and shrub does have the mycorrhizal fungi. A lot of the other products from down earth do not have the mycorrhizal fungus. They also sell mycorrhizal fungus in a little just by itself without the fertilizer in a little package. We have some of those around too. So I'll open one of these up. Normally, if you were just using this, you'd use several scoops of it, but since we have the Osmocote already in there, We'll just add uh, one scoop. So organic fertilizers generally have to add a lot more because they're less concentrated. We'll pour that in. And then when you water it, it'll kind of mix in with the top of the soil. We don't usually mix it in before we water them just because I'll forget which ones I fertilized and which ones I didn't. <laughs> So we just leave it sitting on top like this, and when we water, we expect to see it. You know, we'll water this three or four times for the first watering, and the action of the water will bury the fertilizer and get it to start working for us. So that's pretty much it. When we put them in full sun now, we've had some, like a couple years ago, we had some really warm days. So we put them in, so we, like, I think uh, last two years ago was 80 degrees in February. And then it was 100 degrees in April. And we thought, boy, we're going to have some problems with our trees. Uh, none of these showed any sign of burning. Some of our older trees with branches like this, which were more flush to the sunlight, did burn in that April two years ago. But because these were, I staked them up nice and straight, the sun really didn't catch them very well. I guess this is so skinny that they just didn't heat them up that much, so we survived that 100 degree heat wave with very, very little damage on the baby plants. And we put them, you know, this weather right now is perfect. It's cloudy today. It'll be cloudy for the next week, and you can get adapted to full sun. They're coming out of a greenhouse, but, uh, and you'll see a little scorching on a few of the leaves out there just because they were taller than the rest, and they got hit by a little more sun that first day we had them. But generally, we got them. We want to get them as much sun as we can early on. Uh, get them going to get some size on them. At our growing ground, they're actually on the west side of a block wall, on top of black plastic and rock. So it's about as hot as you can figure uh, a spot would be. Yes. So if yes, yeah, so the question is, what happens when they burn? Um, So this is a somewhat burned branch here, this brown area. Now, if it gets severe, this isn't severe enough. It's still putting out new leaves. If it's severe enough, it cuts off the circulation, and that branch will just not grow. And I, I always remember back in the 80s, we had a, I had an avocado with a branch sticking out like this in my yard. And then this, it was, um, I think it was about 102 degrees. 
it burnt right there and it broke off the next day. It was such a bad burn that it broke the whole stem off. I couldn't believe it. So then we got more serious about protecting from sunlight. Now, we noticed that when we grow them or when Brokaw grows trees for us, they usually don't burn until it's well over 100. Uh, 100, you know, if it gets about 105, we start worrying. Whereas we used to get them from other growers and they would burn at 95. So we know their trees weren't as healthy. If they're burning at 95 uh, degrees, then you know they're just not. Their root system's not as good as what we can what we can grow ourselves or we can get from Brokaw. So, well, no, they a lot of the scorched branches recover. I mean, we've seen them burn to the to the wood and the heart of the tree, and the bark just regrows around it. But when they're young branches, yeah, it can kill them. It can actually kill them when they're young branches. The older branches don't seem to get killed. Now, if you do have severely burnt areas of your tree, they're more subject to insect attack later, which is bad too. There's that polyphagus beetle that goes around drilling into avocados, introducing fungi, and then you have to amputate that whole area to, to get rid of it. So, if, you know, if it's severely sunburned and it's a big open wound and it's not closing fast, because a lot of times if it's just a smaller branch and they get sunburned and it and it kills the tissue right there. This isn't dead, but when it kills it, they'll they'll crack and grow over the area with the surrounding tissue. You can see it growing over the area, and that'll close the wound. But and you can paint that wound too, so that the bugs don't recognize it as a open wound. So that's the reason we paint our houses because bugs that want to drill into the wood don't recognize paint as a plant. So latex paint. So we, I should water this immediately, however, this soil is actually fairly damp, so we'll just leave this for now. So that's how we want to grow them, and again, uh, oh, what I usually do is put the name of the plant and the date on here. Uh, when I potted it up, this will tell me what it is for now, uh, so I know what's, what time it should be ready which is about three or four months from now. Um, now, what I usually do is I want them to look like this plant here. So the stem on this plant, this was planted from plants that were sitting around all summer long, so we finally got it into the pot in August. You know, they were sitting in these little things for that long, they were really root bound. And uh, this trunk is a good, that's a good half inch caliper now maybe even a little bit bigger than half inch caliper. And we figure this is strong enough now I can grab it and knock the pot off without losing anything. So, and this won't break off either. So I wanna, so visually it looks strong enough. Um, you can see how big this got after two years. Now, we used to didn't think growing avocados in pots was a worthwhile thing to do because when we saw avocados growing, they were never that heavy in fruit. Uh, but about four years ago, one of my friends showed me his avocado in a 24-inch box like this. He had 80 fruit on it. I'm going, okay. I changed my mind. Avocados are worth growing in containers. If you get 80 fruit in a container this big, his tree was five years old in that in that size box and it had 80 fruit. I was going, okay, that's better than I've ever done in the ground. So it's worthwhile if you know if you have good soil. Uh, and this friend of mine is a geologist, he knows soil as well as I do. So uh, he did a good job with his his tree. I, I got a question. Mm -hmm. that, that when the trunk's about that thick. Right, so three or four months. So the uh, other problem with leaving in a small pot, especially during the summer, is as you get older, the roots, you know, the roots right now are in the middle, they're protected. <clears throat> three months, the roots will be on the outside. And if the sun hits this on a hot day, it's gonna be 120 degrees, 130 degrees, it's gonna burn all those roots up. So by, before summer, it's nice, you know, before the first heat wave, well, if it, if it is a heat wave, you just shade this thing. Or if you put it in a bigger container, 
<clears throat> it's now insulated with a couple inches of dirt again all around it. So and, and until the rest of the year, you should be fine in a 15 gallon if you want to leave it in a black plastic pot. Again, you can just paint the pots white. You know, uh, Brocon Nursery, our supplier, when we first met them, they were using white plastic because they thought the black plastic was going to kill their plants. But they soon discovered that for most of the year, the white plastic's too cold. Too cold to grow. So they switched back to black plastic. <clears throat> and then in the summertime, they just go out with whitewash and paint them white. But yeah, so for three months of the year, it's too hot for black plastic. But for nine months of the year, the white plastic doesn't generate enough heat. So the roots are slower. And after you get them in that chicken pot, you have to go up another, another like a crystal or a Right, right. Our yeah, one inch caliper. We like one inch ground. caliper. Uh, you can put them in the ground at the, at, at, at half inch. I mean, this is what, this is how big they are when most avocados are planted. <clears throat> and that one you probably won't step on anymore. Um, I mean, you, you could wait. You can put it in a bigger pot. The only thing I don't like about putting them in bigger and bigger containers is that most avocado roots in the ground won't go deeper than about a foot, foot and a few inches. And if you start putting them in a pot that's like 20 inches deep, and then you put this in the ground, those bottom roots may die off because they're, they can't breathe. So that, that's one problem with the nursery industry is to make pots too deep. Uh, plant roots rarely go below a foot. <clears throat> Unless you have real sandy soil, they might grow a foot and a half, but <clears throat> they don't go that deep in the ground, and if you go deeper than you have, then that's, that can be a problem. <clears throat> now, the other thing about avocados <clears throat> is they do respond well to you know, warm dirt, more oxygen around the roots. So oxygen around the roots, you know, if the water is clean and it's got access to the atmosphere, this water is well oxygenated. The soil, because it blocks the flow of air, can cause trouble. So if you want to do a real good job on avocados, instead of planting, you know, if you have sandy soil, just plant them at ground level. But if you have, like in my last house, I had the worst clay, and I couldn't even dig it. I mean, it, uh, the shovels were bouncing off. And my friend, the geologist, is, he says he was the one who told the, that, that um, developer how to how to fix that clay so it wouldn't slide down the hill. So they had all these earth movers moving over that property to pack it down as hard as they can so it wouldn't absorb any water. That's why we couldn't dig it. He said, don't even try digging it. So what we did is we set our avocado just on top of that and piled dirt I got from a building supplier all around it. Now we did have a 10 foot drop off at the edge of the property. And what I did is I put an avocado right in there, right at that 10-foot drop-off, and it did fine. Even though it was solid clay and it wasn't draining well, that 10-foot drop-off behind my house um, would draw the water downwards toward the next property, and I guess the air was being pulled in to that soil behind it. So even though this was surrounded by clay, and I didn't try to amend the clay because I couldn't, this tree actually grew five feet the first year I had it there. I was just amazed that it grew that well. You know, I wasn't, I wasn't expecting that at all. <clears throat> These in this hill grew 10 feet the first year. So they did really well. well. They were older trees, but they did really well on that. So the other method, of course, is you can <clears throat> put some blocks up and make it smaller. This was uh, about 8 foot across mound, about 18 inches high. Very sandy soil, didn't move with the rains or the irrigation. If I had a choice again, I'd probably use decomposed granite instead of sandies. So there's sandy loam, and there's decomposed granite, which is often called DG. Um, a lot of the orchards, especially down in San Diego County, are on decomposed granite. And I like DG a lot because it doesn't move at all. You pile it up around the tree, and it just sits there. Even if the rains are hitting, it just doesn't move. So DG is a little more stable, and, the, and it still breathes well. It's chunkier than sandy loam, than sandy soil, which is sandy loam. Don't, don't put any compost in there. If you put compost in there, you're going to kill your trees. Yes. <clears throat> uh, 
Yeah, slopes are good. So most, a lot of orchards, especially in Orange County, are on the sides of this hill over here uh, because of the drainage. So as long as you're not at the bottom of the slope, you've got good drainage. Now, if, you, if you've got a slope like this, try to make sure that the root ball is equal to the slope at that point so it doesn't get covered up, or at least the trunk doesn't get covered too deep. You first you'll have to make a basin that you'll have enough dirt in there to put a basin on this side to catch the water. <clears throat> the only thing bad about slopes, they're hard to water unless you have drip on it. Sprinklers just keep running down. If you put a lot of mulch on top of the ground after you're done, then that'll kind of hold the water in place. But yeah, you just don't want to be at the bottom slope. The bottom slopes is the wettest area. You can stay really wet all winter. Um, so if the water sits too long, uh, like in my last house in my backyard, that spot where he did this, in previous years before that, when we had like 98 El Nino, the water just sat there till April of that year. Uh, and we lost, we lost some persimmons that were in the ground there because the water wasn't moving at all. So we knew we had to build up to, to get rid of that because if the water sits too long and it's, and it's mixed with dirt, then the oxygen can't get through to let the roots breathe in that water that's sitting there. So, I mean, this has no problem because the water circulates, but in the ground, if it's, if the water's sitting there and it's just, there's clay all around and it doesn't move fast enough to get enough oxygen to the roots, then you get root rot and then you can lose your whole plant. Um, symptoms of root rot, the leaves get smaller and smaller with brown tips, brown and yellow tips. Now this is pretty much normal for a lot of avocado trees this time of year. So just to know, right before they bloom, some avocado trees will drop all their leaves and when they drop them, they're all brown by the time they drop them. And then they bloom, some bloom naked without any leaves on them and right after they finish blooming, they put on a new set of leaves. So some years, the same tree will be bare when it's blooming. Sometimes it'll be green when it's blooming. Um, you never know what to expect, but most of our trees, the majority of them do drop their leaves right when they're blooming and get new ones on. And they look ugly when they're dropping. But if you see a lot of this brown tipping in the summer and your leaves getting smaller and smaller and you're not getting much growth, that's root rot. And unfortunately, if you buy an avocado tree from another grower and you put it in the ground and you've got heavy soil, you've probably already got, you've probably bought a plant with root rot already. And if the soil is not sandy enough, it just festers and eventually your plant, you know, just sits there and never does anything. I mean, if your plant doesn't grow, either grow two or three foot in one year or fruit, there's something wrong with it. We just use pot top, top pot here because of the weight. Now, just so you know, uh, the original potting soil, and still probably the best, is pure sand. Okay. So when I was a kid, my dad loaded up, grew everything in very white sand. You know, it wasn't pure sand, it was a little dirty. It had maybe 5% clay in it. But I played with it in it when I was a kid. I know the texture. I know the texture because my ki my brothers and I would make forts and roads and stuff like that. When you got it wet, it would hold together, but it wasn't solid clay because you can just hit it and it would just bust apart again. It had just um, um, a minor amount, I would say five to between five and ten percent clay, yep. but most of it was sand, a little silt, and that was the original potting soil. And there's nothing wrong with that except for the weight. So if that was in here, it would be about forty pounds. This is about less than 20 so when I was a kid I couldn't pick up the containers and we didn't even use 15 gallon buckets in those days it was either five gallon or boxes because the 15 gallon how do you move those things you know they were they would weigh a couple hundred pounds with filled with real dirt and uh, they would either go one gallon five gallon or box and that was all we had in those days and then in the 80s they wanted to make everything lighter so for some reason, they went to ground up wood and bark as a soil, and that. And then in the late 80s, they told us, you're watering too much. The plants are rotting because you're watering too much. 
and they never figured out it was the ground up wood and the bark that were doing that to the plants. To this day, we just can't figure out why the industry can't figure it out for itself. Because we figured this out in the 90s. I mean, my dad told me, you know, I was in grad school and he, and I came back to the nursery, he says, you figure this out. We've been watering our plants daily for the last 30 years and suddenly it doesn't work. So anyway, so the first year or so, you feed them, you feed them, you feed them, get some size, then we want them to be full of leaves, easy six foot by six foot. And then at that point, uh, they fruit better if you back off on the fertilizer. But get get the lots of foliage, get them real full, so they don't you know they hide their trunks, they don't sunburn. Um, so you just keep feeding them uh, fruit, you know, high nitrogen fertilizers. Um, this one's not that high. This one's higher. This one's five 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 two. But high the high first number is fine. And then once you get the fruiting size, um, the dead leaves on the ground are are enough, are almost enough to just keep them well fed uh, and then let them produce fruit. Now the research we've seen on Hass, which is kind of general for a lot of avocados, uh, on mature trees don't fertilize them between November and June. So between November and June they're forming their flowers, they're blooming, they're setting their fruit, uh, and they said in June you can fertilize them and make the leaves grow, but if you fertilize them when they're blooming, making flowers, a lot of times they'll drop, abort the fruit to grow more leaves. It's what we've been told. So, um, you know, they said June to November fertilizer is okay. Starve them this time of year. Um, but when they're young, don't hesitate to feed them. Just keep them going. Well, they may not grow as fast, but they should make it. Okay. They should make it. They need some from right, they're a little delicate at this point. Some of those out there are a lot skinnier than this, so, okay. um, and some of them are only like, you know, they'd be this tall on the ground. <laughs> they would be very big. So we like, we just like to do this. I mean, um, I have seen videos of farms planting plants about this size right into the ground so it's it's being done but because um, you know this is a pain for a farm to have to do that but you have to be very careful yeah and you can lose them real easily yes you don't have to I mean you can use sand if you want to grow you know so the more airy the soil is the faster it will grow so put you can surround it with sand you can surround it with our top pot uh and it'll grow faster but you be aware of when you're doing that you're also going to dry out faster and you're going to have to fertilize more too so there's compromises to everything but yeah if you want the speed of growth i mean if you really want it fast you put um what are called um, uh, clay pellets around it but your fired clay pellets they really breathe well, and they, they do hold some moisture. Yes? So would you recommend when you put in the ground to mix your mixture back dry soil with PG? You can do that. Yeah. yeah, there's nothing wrong with mixing, you know, clay <laughs> soil with sand or anything like that. Uh, um, just don't, you know, again, no compost. Compost on top, pure mineral below is how nature set up. Mulch so, on top? Like lots of mulch on top. Gypsum's also good. I didn't. I forgot to bring it up here. So sometimes when we get older trees from Brokaw, and I am getting some older trees from Brokaw this year, sometimes they have what looks like a handful of gypsum right on top of the root ball of that plant, and it's the and the container's about the same size as this, and they got a handful of gypsum sitting right there. It apparently, doesn't hurt them. Um, on right, they put it on top. Well, the gypsum. As it dissolves, it helps water absorb better, but they also found out that gypsum helps prevent root rot. And we don't know the exact reason for that, but putting gypsum around them helps prevent root rot. 
Gypsum is involved, which is calcium sulfate. Calcium is involved in the wood of a plant, uh, also in the development of fruit, so it, it's all good. And apparently putting a handful of gypsum on the tree when they're real small doesn't seem to hurt them. I haven't done that yet. With our top pot, I don't expect to have any root rod problems. So. Oh, yes. True. I mean, plants in nature are programmed to drop their leaves straight down so that they have they can recycle the nutrients in their own leaves. I mean, I'm sure that's why trees drop their leaves and they fall straight down. So a friend of mine went down to Guatemala. He said they were hunting underneath the wild avocado trees to see how deep the leaf mulch was. He said on some of the trees it was piled up five feet of dead leaves underneath those avocado trees in the wild. I mean, that's just unfathomable. <laughs> so, but, you know, the air's got to be able to get through this stuff. So if it's, you know, if, it, if you have a real fine mulch, don't go too deep. If it's, you know, leaves are pretty coarse. The air can still get through them. But be careful. If you get too fine a mulch and you put it, bury it, bury the ground deeply, the air may, the oxygen may not be able to get through that to the soil to, to keep the roots healthy. So, yes. Yeah, when you fertilize them, you know, initially, follow the instructions. It says every six months, this will have instructions to um, every three months, this one says. Now, in containers, um, organic fertilizers tend to wash through or blow off real fast. That's why Dad would fertilize once a month in a container. In the ground, everything kind of stays put, but in a container, it tends to leave the pots faster. So you have to fertilize with if you use organics more frequently in a pot than you would in the ground. Now we do again watch for sun burning. You can use, you know, go to a hardware store buy white latex paint, cut in half with water if you don't like it to look stark white, and paint whatever the sun can hit real easily. You know, if it's vertical, it's not easy for the sun to hit that unless we get into you know, if you have, if you're in October, it's 100 degrees, sun's coming from a severe angle and it can hit this. But in the summertime, usually the sun's more straight up. Of course, you'll have to watch the east and the west sides of the tree and see if it's exposed to that hot sun. You know, so you watch out, you know, watch for the heat warnings. And then uh, white latex paint here, don't paint the leaves, just paint the stems. The leaves don't actually burn in the sun unless it's like over 110. <clears throat> Um, this is what a type of product that the organic orchards would use. So the Ivy Organics are the organic whitewashes. And they're made out of uh, silica gel. Um, milk. Powdered milk. Silica gel. Diatomaceous earth, which is the same thing as silica gel. Mica. Um, this is a powder. You mix some of it with water. You can, if you mix the whole thing with water at one time, it'll do about five good-sized trees. Um, I usually just put a tablespoon or something in a little plastic cup, mix it up, paint the stems on on a few avocado trees at a time. So it goes quite a ways. And they come in different colors. If you don't like white, they've got green and kind of a beige, or they have the traditional white. So in orchards, they're, they're really um, conscious about protecting the bottom of the tree. Because you can burn the entire top off and it'll regrow from the bottom if the bottom's not burned. But once you burn the bottom, you're, you're history. So a lot of orchards have cardboard coming up the trunk a few feet. That also helps against rodents. But uh, with all that's important. Bug-wise... Um, there's a couple of nasty ones out there, and I know I brought, let's see if I have a sample. <clears throat> there we go. <clears throat> so on avocado leaves, I'll bring this closer to my camera. 
So about 25 years ago, a bug came up from Mexico called a perseamite, and it causes little brown, round dots on your leaves. Actually, they're silver when they first start, and then they turn brown. Uh, sometimes you can see it on the top, but definitely on the bottom of the leaf, there's these little brown spots along the veins. And if you look underneath the good jeweler's loop or microscope, you'll notice that each, especially if they're silvery, round dot is actually a spider web. And underneath each spider web is a little colony of perseamites, which are tiny spiders that are, instead of sucking on bugs like most spiders do, they suck on single cells of a leaf at a time and suck out the contents. And if it gets bad enough, the whole leaf just drops. Now the plant cures itself by dropping all its leaves, but that's, that's a waste, a lot of energy. The plant's gotta grow a new set of leaves, it can sunburn. So about 15 years ago, the universities went down to Mexico, found the mite that eats this mite. So what happens now is about every two or three years, a wave of per se mites goes through a neighborhood. Now they can, there's several ornamental trees. They also get on the camphor trees are in the same family as avocado. So they can actually go from camphor to avocado to camphor. So a wave of this stuff goes through the neighborhoods of the per se mites and then a wave of the beneficial mites comes right behind them and cleans them up. So we don't, it's not as bad as it was back in the late 90s where the trees would just totally defoliate. Now they get like this and then they get cleaned up by the benefit. You know, these mites blow in the air. They're so small, a good strong wind will blow them around the neighborhood. So the orchards don't have to treat this anymore. They'll just wait, they'll just see it. They'll, you know, keep an eye on it. And the beneficial mites usually come through and clean it up. If you want to just clean it up, and we like to, if we get it, just use a nice oil spray. This is uh, all seasons horticultural uh, and dormant spray oil. You, so you can spray it any time of the year. Don't spray it if it's raining or cold. It needs to evaporate within uh, a few hours after you spray it. So it kills by suffocation. It covers the mites. They can't breathe. They die. The oil evaporates. The tree can breathe again. On most scales, it does. Uh, I know. Side cats, side cats on most scales, it does. So, okay. what's happened in the last 50 years? They used to use scales on all the mites. Uh, excuse me, oil on all the scales in the orchards, and then in the last 20 years, some of the scales have been coming immune to the oil sprays. It's like they're evolving snorkels or something. <laughs> so we're having, yeah. We're having trouble now with some scales with oil because they're become immune to it. It's 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 kind of scary. Yeah. So right. Well, uh, we don't know how they become immune to oils. I mean, it could be that they're developing a something on their outer portions of their body that's that's resistant I mean the oil won't stick to it, it could be something like that I don't know <laughs> yes well most oils even if you just spray one side the leaf it migrates as the water evaporates the oil migrates this mixes with water as it goes out this is 90 percent oil it mixes with water it comes out at about one or two percent oil but we notice as the oil droplets evaporate the oil uh, the water droplets evaporate the oil kind of spreads around the leaf so it doesn't have to be perfect it's nice if you can spray both sides but it doesn't have to be quite perfect um, I haven't I haven't used that for anything uh, I haven't heard vinegar as a insect control. Soap? soap can help. So soap uh, can help kill certain bugs, but we read an article from Concern Reports about 30 years ago saying that it works better if your water's soft and your air temperature's humid and hot. That's not so they said it works. <laughs> It works a lot better in New Jersey than it does in California on the West Coast because our water's hard and our air's dry, so the water evaporates too fast. The soap, you know, they said, yeah, 
on the East Coast it works great, West Coast not so good. So comparatively. I mean, if you get distilled water and it's a nice humid day and, uh, you know. Now there's a, some new pests that have appeared. One is a thrip that's causing the fruit to discolor. Now this doesn't hurt the inside of this fruit. But you see what it does to the outside. So commercially, this is a disaster to have this rough, russeted skin. Thrips. So there's new, new bugs in town. There's the avocado thrips are causing um, the surface of the skin to get really nasty looking. Now if you wanted to make your trees more appealing, Spinosad is the best control we have for thrips. And there's different brands of Spinosad out there. So thrips are really small bugs that like tender surfaces to suck on. Uh, and fruits is one thing they like. You know, we get thrip damage on nectarines. That's really bad. Um, but, you know, again, it doesn't affect the quality of the flesh. So it's, if you're, if you're trying to sell them, then yeah, you might want to do that. And there's some other new bugs. There's an avocado lace bug that causes this appearance on the leaves. So little lace bugs are sucking on the leaves and causing all kinds of blackening and stuff like that. That's the newest one we've seen. We haven't seen a, I'll look at the literature and see if they have a, a treatment for it yet. I think oil will do decently on that bug, but I, I haven't seen a, uh, a real good treatment uh, protocol yet put out. We'll see. Let me think. Uh, now there's, this is wind damage up here. It's kind of messed up the leaves that was sticking above a wall. Um, we don't get too many, ins you know, now and then we'll get a, a caterpillars on, on avocados. They usually don't do damage damage. Uh, grasshoppers do a little damage too, but most of the other insect pests aren't as bad as the ones mentioned. So scale, uh, persamites, uh, the lace bug, those are the main ones. Um, I think we did most oh well mm -hmm. yeah this isn't a preventative at all the oil it just evaporates and it's gone and spinosad only lasts two weeks so you'd have to spray it every two weeks so you could it's a pain and it's not good for the environment to do any spraying that often it's better to do minimal spraying so that because you know Eventually, if you spray this all the time and that's the only thing you spray on the thrips, you'll have a population of thrips. That's, they said this kills 94% of thrips. So the 6% of thrips that this doesn't kill then become your main problem. So, so uh, we do you like to use am, well, ant baits like Amdro to stop ants because ants bring scale and maybe bugs and things like that. So. That on avocados, it's been of minor importance. If you have other fruit trees, ants seem to be a bigger problem than on avocados, but it, potentially they can bring... Uh, this is a... Well, most of the ant baits right now, the, the ones that work good, corn, corn meal, you open this up, it looks like corn meal. They have uh, some vegetables added to make it more appealing to the ants. You know, ants love... Um, uh, what do you call it? What's, what's that Doritos. chip? Not Doritos, but the other corn chip. Fritos. Fritos. Ants love Fritos. So, so, corn, <laughs> so corn chips plus more oil, perfect bait. And then they have a small amount of a slow-acting poison here. So the ants can eat it. They can feed the super colonies in the area for days, and then they all die. So it, it does a better job of killing ants. You, you know, 20 years ago, all we had were contact poison. You put it out, ant touches it, or walks by it, it dies. But it only kills that ant. And then it wears off in two weeks and the ants come back again. But this has a chance to kill the entire super colony off in your neighborhood. When this came out, we used it in our yard about 2002, I think. And for the next 15 years, no one in my neighborhood saw any ants. We're going, okay, this is incredible. <laughs> is that organic by chance? No. <laughs> 
there aren't any good organic and controls that will work as well as this does. I mean, there are organic controls, but you've got to keep doing them. And I don't know that the organic control, which involves boric acid, is safer than this. Boric acid is this a natural poison, but I don't know if it's safer. <laughs> so they consider boric acid to be okay to use in organic farms because it's a natural poison. Just like, I don't know, you know, uh, another natural poison would be... Uh, Here, what would be uh, in that chocolate? Get down in it, to draw a line across there and then... Oh. <laughs> well, Consumer Reports ran an article on that, too. They said you know, some are, are don't work, and some have these poisons that are not legal in, in the United States. Yeah. Yeah the, 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 yeah, the chalk that we used to do to stop the ants, that was apparently nasty stuff that was in there. <laughs> yes. Doesn't work very long. So... This product, with the yellow labels, they put in uh, castor oil, cinnamon oil, clove, garlic, peppermint, rosemary, and spearmint to stop bugs from going up your tree. It doesn't work very long. And they always seem to find another route to go up. So, unless you spray everything, you know, it's better, it's easier just to kill the ants than it is to try to stop them. So, um... So shape-wise, now most of these trees, you know, if, if, if like in my friend's orchard, they've got some trees that's, that are about 8 foot by 8 foot, and they're getting up to 300 fruit on those, uh, on the gym. It was a gym that they showed me, this tree made 300 fruit. Now it doesn't do it every year. It, it, if they do that much in one year, they usually take the next year and only do 5 or 10, and then they'll, then they'll go back and do 300 again. So if those trees make that much fruit, you don't need to let them get any bigger than that. And a lot of the trees we're selling, you'll notice that they say compact small because they're real heavy producers. When they're producing that heavy, they don't tend to grow. Um, Hass, they said, is only gets one good crop every three years, so we don't do Hass anymore. And during those other two years where it's not cropping heavy, it tends to grow three feet that year. So they eventually end up, you know, 20 foot tall in 10 years, and then you've got to cut them back. Now... Orchard managers that I talk to says, oh, we don't let them grow 20 anymore. We just cut them every year. Just keep cutting them. Keep them down around 10 foot. So you can do that too. But a lot of these other trees, they're such heavy producers now that they're going to regulate their own size. But again, you know, just keep them cut to maybe 8 by 8. That's a good size. If they can make 300 fruit at that size. So one of the problems we have is that avocados are best when they're bee pollinated. And the problem with bees is that they don't like avocado flowers. So I read this uh, research report, University of California, Riverside, which their field stations in Irvine. You know, they make a million, the average 15-foot avocado tree, they said, makes about a million flowers a year. And they get an average of 100 fruit a year, which means one flower out of every 10,000 flowers is making a fruit. And the researcher there said, it's got to be the bees. They're not liking the flowers well enough. So he went out and hand pollinated the Hass tree by himself. He got 700 fruit. So it's a bee. So a bee is part of the problem now. It could be that the Hass alone is the problem. But uh, what we saw, uh, so this was like 10 years ago. I had three avocado trees. So they said that the problem, that the problem is, you have citrus next to your bee, your avocados. The bees really like the citrus flowers better. So they go over to the citrus tree instead of your avocado. So in my last house, I had about a dozen citrus and five avocado trees. And when about 99% of the bloom was over, I was out there checking the fruit, and I saw no avocados on any of my trees. Plenty of bees. They're all on my citrus trees. So we're going, okay, what do we do? So we, we looked on the internet, and there's a couple of two uh, YouTube videos on avocados and bees. And the guy says, well, you just make your flowers more attractive. So they took honey and water in a spritzer bottle. It was one quarter honey, three quarters water. 
and we noticed we had to use hot water to get this stuff to dissolve and you spray the flowers or you, if you just spray the tree the bees will come because they can smell the honey and they'll just investigate it and land in the flowers because there's flowers have landing patterns so I had I had 10 flowers left on one branch and that was all I had that in June that year I had 10 flowers left on one branch so I tried that I just spritz the that 10 flowers I had five fruit out of 10 flowers yeah the guy says you don't have to do the hand pollination just trick the bees and get them over there now we've been told by a bee colonist that be careful some of the honey being sold is not good quality so I got this from the orchard where they have a beehive so we know this is good quality honey because they say a lot of the honey in the market's been stretched with carol syrup or it's got diseases in it that might hurt the other beehives so be careful where you get your honey get it from you know farmers market someplace you trust that they have good honey and spritz them when they're in bloom and if there's bees in there, they'll, they can smell that. They'll just come over and, and do the things. And the guys in the video that were showing, they're showing what looked like clusters of grapes on their avocado tree. And everyone who's tried it says, this works. Now, last year didn't work so good. It just kept raining, and it was 50 degrees out. And it's like, what do you do? Couldn't do much last year with that weather we had. It was just cold. So, so you're saying people They can smell the honey. Yeah. Yes. You can, but most fruit trees don't eat it. They're, they, they, they're very attractive to the bees. The bees will find them. It's just avocados. They said that. The, I don't know who checked it, but they said the nectar is bitter. So that bees, if they have a better source of nectar, they'd go to that before they went to avocados. Now, if you have only avocados and you got a beehive, you're set. So, do the natural trees in places like Central Mexico and Guatemala not set that much fruit, or do they have a different pollinator, or do they not? Well, there are different poll. You know, honeybees are native to Europe; they're not native to the United, you know, to the north, to Western Hemisphere at all. Right. So, there's different bees that probably grew up with these uh, native bees that we don't have either that are down there that like these flowers, but I don't know. I haven't really seen any more research on the bees on these. But yeah, honeybees aren't native anywhere near here. Yes. If they bloom at the same time, it's competition. So it's better not to have anything near an avocado tree when it's blooming, unless you do this. I mean, if you do this, then your avocado tree comes to starve your garden. But citrus do not require bees at all to get fruit. They're they're self-pollinating, or they don't we call it. They're they don't need to be fertilized at all to make fruit. They make fruit without even being fertilized. Um, well, I mean, avocados will grow in shade or sun. They just fruit better in sun than they do in shade. Uh, they'll still fruit a little. I mean, you know, you go down to where they're native to, it's jungle down there. So, so usually what happens if you have a lot of shade, the top of your tree is the only part that produces fruit. So, because it's, it's got the sunlight. So, you know, the more sun you can have, the better. No, if, if the branch is sunburned and it's still alive, it'll make more leaves, right? So other than making your trees just kind of round shaped, uh, right now the project going on supposedly right this year at, at the field station Irvine, they're espalying avocado trees because Japan has always done it that way. In, in Japan, they don't grow them outside because it just freezes there. So they grow them in, in Quonset huts with trees the container has trees going down the middle and they put their branches in two directions up a wire going like this 
and they showed that, and they have beehives inside, but they showed that these things just load up really heavily on those branches. So they said that the, the reason, and they've done it in South Africa too, even though South Africa doesn't need to be in a greenhouse, they said they're getting more better production on what they've got on espaliered branches. And the theory is, is that this branch, when it's forming, is out in the sun, it gets lots of energy, it makes flowers, makes the fruit, and when the fruit forms, the branch just goes whoop. It just, it, the fruit's so heavy, it just pulls that branch into darkness. It just goes right into darkness. That, they said that branch will never have enough energy to flower again. So the tree has to grow another branch out here, and then that blooms, and it does the same thing. It drops down into the shade. So what we've noticed, so in my observations of avocados over the years, about eight years ago, my wife and I are at the Great Park, because we, we plant an avocado at the Great Park, and we wanted to count the fruit on it. Well, what was weird, and I didn't know why this was happening at the time, there was one branch that was like eight inches off the ground, about five foot long. Totally low with avocados that were touching the dirt. Fifty avocados in one branch, five foot long. That one branch had more avocados than the rest of the tree. We're going, well, this is odd. And then I was at another a customer's house later that year, and they had a half avocado. One branch covering their flagstone, loaded with fruit. And apparently the reason why they're loaded is because they can't hide from the sun. They were sitting there on the ground, full sunlight, totally loaded with fruit. And, yeah, in the heat, real hot sun. And they're totally loaded. I'm going, okay. So that's why they espalate them, because they can't hide. They're just sitting right there. So they're trying to figure out which avocados the spally are the best um, so that they can try that because apparently per square foot you get more fruit when they're spallier than you do when they're a free-form tree. And you know they've done that with the apples in the past too because apples have the same problem. They're so heavy the branches dive. So, so that's something new and you know you don't have to have an espalier. You can just have a whole bunch of steaks and run lines to hold these branches horizontal so they don't dive away when they have fruit on them. All right. So that's something we're going to be trying. Yes. Right. Um, there's some open. Okay, so there, there's another thing going on, too, where they tell you get an A and a B avocado. What, what an A avocado is, So there's, there tends to be two, tends to be, it's not perfect. So type A, and most avocados we sell are type A. The, in the AM hours and the PM hours, the flowers open in the AM, they're female, which is the center part. And in the PM, that same flower, the male stamens, you know, the male stamens are kind of plastered to the petals in the morning. In the afternoon, they come up and they release the pollen, and the female part is kind of messed up by that time. So they're male in the afternoon and female in the morning. And then the type B, the flowers open in the afternoon, and they're female at that time, and then they stay open until the next morning, and they're male at that time, and the female is not so good. So... If you, in theory, if you have a type A next to a type B, you'll get better pollination. Um, the problem is the bees don't really go that far. If your trees are like 10 feet apart, the bees may just stay right here and not go over there and then come back here. They've seen that in orchards, so it's got to be really close. But the, unfortunately, the best research we've seen so what they did is they because you know Hass is the original Hass doesn't produce as well as some of the new offspring so what they said to do is you have and it has to be Zutano. Zutano avocado is the best pollinator for the Hass types it's a B type avocado and you have eight Hasses around it what the research has shown is that 
putting these in the tunnel, they will increase production of all eight of these by 11%. But you had to take out 12% of your orchard to do that. Is that worthwhile? I mean, if Zutano was sellable, it'd be worthwhile, but it's not. It's not a commercial avocado. You can't sell it. It's decent tasting, but it's not nearly as good as Hass. So you've taken out 12% of your orchard to increase production by 11%. So University of California said, well, some years it's 15%. Well, that means some years it's 5%. You know, if it's 11% is average, you can't make a, a argument that says to put this B type in among the A's. So now what they're saying is don't do Zutano. Just get other versions of Hass that are B types that potentially can pollinate the A type. Because they probably won't. So what, what's going on? They sit on a mature tree. The branches aren't perfectly synchronous. The flowering is not synchronous. Some branches will be totally off. They'll be off. They'll be uh, blooming in the B schedule and not the A schedule. So this is Jim, which is a granddaughter of Hess. So, um, so they said, you know, if you have, you know, another B type, uh, Hass type fruit is surprised. So a lot of the orchards are going surprise and gem, surprise and gem, because they're both close enough to Hass that they can sell them as Hass. Potentially they can cross pollinate. They're both really heavy producers though by themselves. So it's you don't really need, you know, won't, don't have to worry as much as a pollination of having quote a Zutano next to it. So. Well, it's nice if they're really, really close because the bees, again, bees don't travel that far between flowers. So it's got to be just a few feet away, really. You could. Uh, it's hard to keep track after a while. So of what is what. And what You know, it's one plant might kill the other by shading it. So you have to watch it that way. But, that, you know, that's certainly doable. Yes. Just depends how big you, so the question was how big is a mature tree? Mature trees are probably all 40, 50 foot. It's just a matter of, so, okay, so we'll have to go over some of the varieties, but 40 years ago when Gwen came out, so Gwen, I mean, there's a dwarf one called Little Cotto which we don't recommend at all because it's not a heavy producer. The fruit's not that good. Uh, but the branches are kind of vine-like, so it doesn't grow up. Um, the one, the avocado, though, that's considered the smallest, just so you know, is this one called Holiday. Okay. Holiday. So Holiday is the smallest avocado known only because left to its own, it won't make a trunk. So they say if you don't put this on a stake, it just it just it's ground cover. <laughs> the branches just lay on the dirt, and the fruit is like this big. It's it's really big, and it'll just form on the ground. <laughs> so that's the smallest avocado tree. They said, yeah, no matter what they do to it, uh, it just lays on the ground. <laughs> it's good fruit. I mean, I would tell you, it's 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 a very distinctive buttery fruit um, but yeah the, it does have some so they're they're saying this is great for a spelling because on its own it's not going to get off the ground and it does harvest they call it holiday because you pick the fruit between July 4th and New Year's Day so covers most of the major holidays so holiday is a good one. I mean, it is a strange one too, though. So I'll put this back. But so they've been doing research here at the Irvine Field Station for a long time. So back in the 80s, they had this thing called Gwen, which we sell and we we like it. So Gwen is now some articles I've seen says it's a daughter of Hass. 
Some other one says it's a daughter of Thiel or Thilly or I don't know how to pronounce T H I L L E. And Thilly is a daughter of Hass. So I'm not sure if it's a daughter of Hass or granddaughter of Hass, but Gwen is the heaviest flowering avocado anyone's ever seen. Um, and because of that, it can set a lot of fruit and kill itself with the amount of fruit it makes. So you have to watch it. So commercially, they try it in orchards for a while and they go, uh, unless we hand thin this every year, the trees that start breaking up in the field, they're just committing suicide because of the weight of the fruit. So the interesting thing about Gwen, so most avocados, they bloom, at, they bloom on the ends of the branches. But when we had a Gwen the same age, second year Gwen, it bloomed off the main trunk too. Every single um, node on this branch was blooming. We've never seen anything like that. Just the whole tree was in bloom. <laughs> it was just crazy. And they said a second year tree. So this is a second year tree. We're setting 54 fruit on average. And the third year trees, 140. So those trees didn't let up, but yeah, the orchards came back and says, we can't do this thing. It just, it just, unless we hand thin the crop, it just breaks up. Break right. And well, two years ago, two of my customers called me up, said, not the same time, but they called me up, my Gwen broke in half. You know, they said, we didn't fit enough and just, the whole trunk just snapped. So, so, so we know it can happen. Um, so Gwen is either daughter or granddaughter of Hass. So what they've done is they said, okay, we'll go back, we'll take daughters of Gwen and see how they do. So the daughters of Gwen, uh, Lamb is one, also known as Lamb Hass. And then Jim, which is this tree here, is another one. And those are really popular commercial trees because they've got the Hass type fruit. They're not perfect like, they don't, you know, they're not exactly like Hass, but they're good enough so that stuff at the store, you know, in the fall, it's summer and fall, it's lamb. Uh, spring and summer, there's a lot of gems being sold at the supermarket on top of Hass. But um, they're much heavier flower bloomers. Like this thing, the gem, you can see this is still not quite as heavy as Gwen, but still very heavy bloom on it. Now this is Carmen. And Carmen is a great bloomer. So Carmen, so like, okay, let's put Hass here. We don't sell Hass because we sell Carmen. So Hass and Carmen are genetically pretty much identical. So Carmen is a Hass that someone found down in Michoacan, Mexico. Carlos Mendez found, so it's called Carmen for him. But it it's a little different than the rare Hass in that it, uh, it doesn't have as much of a central leader. It tends to branch out sideways a lot. And because of that, it tends to bloom really well. And it also tends to bloom more than once a year. Now, they've, also, they've found a lot of Hasses over the years that have bloomed more than once a year. They have more than one crop. But they haven't been able to reproduce. In other words, they take a cutting off of that tree to make a new tree, and the new tree doesn't do the same thing. It doesn't do the two blooms per year. It doesn't have fruit year round like some of the Hass trees do. Well, this Carmen was the first one that they were able to reproduce in huge numbers, and it still tends to flower off season uh, several times a year. Uh, it tends to produce heavier than the regular Hass. So instead of carrying the Hass, we carry the Carmen, which is just a Hass that blooms weirdly they call them loco they said they're crazy bloomers uh, now if you have a has a carmen orchard you tend to get more fruit than a has orchard uh it tends not to alternate bear as severely so alternate bearing if it, did that explain alternate <coughs> bearing yet? so if a tree produces too much fruit one year if it's totally loads up it's so exhausted after that year then the next year it doesn't even bloom but because it doesn't bloom that year, doesn't start a crop, the next year it's so full of energy, it tends to overcrop again. So it goes through that cycle where a lot of, too much fruit, no fruit, too much fruit, no fruit, that's alternate bearing. So Carmen tends not to do that because it can bloom any time. So sometimes if it has a heavy load, 
it doesn't make the spring bloom, but then after the fruit's off, it makes the summer bloom. So you can get, you can get, so it tends to stop the alternate bearing cycle because it can bloom any time it wants. The problem with karma is we never know what's going to do that year. So they said if you have a karma in orchard, you'll notice this tree's in bloom, this tree's not, this tree's in bloom. So you, it's like a, they said it's like a checkerboard pattern. The, the, all the trees are doing something different. So you go into Karma Orchard and find ripe food all anytime you want, but it's not going to be on one tree. The trees do all kinds of weird things. Like like I have a car in my house, in one year it bloomed four times and set food every time it bloomed. But then it didn't bloom for two years. And then it bloomed the normal bloom. And it does whatever it wants. So. Now, I do have some customers, though, who keep sending me pictures of their karma. Because, <laughs> I, you know, I figured if it's got a fruit on, it's not going to bloom there on that same branch because that fruit's taking all the energy. So they're, they're sending me pictures of their karma tree. Fruit hanging right here, it's blooming all around the fruit. So not necessarily the case here. So they said, they said their karma tree it just doesn't stop, just doesn't stop. In fact, the karma tree plant at the Great Park, they told us, Ten years ago, they told us we can go out there and pick fruit any day we want off that tree. So every carmine tree seems to do something different, but a lot of the orchards are going in our carmines because they know they can get fruit anytime they want off that orchard, not off of one tree, but off that orchard they can get it. And if you have a year like one of our one one of the persons who worked at Brokaw said they have their own orchard, and nine, 2008 was such a cold spring like it was last year, they couldn't get any fruits, flowers to set that, that winter at all, that winter spring blooming period. But their carmines bloomed again that summer and set a great crop, so it, it saved their, their crop that, that next year. They had, a, they had a good crop even though they didn't get any fruit set at all that spring. So carmines have the ability to make up for what, for bad weather conditions. Um, in Mexico, they said they bloom a little earlier than they do here which makes the avocados ripen earlier, which means they can sell them for, for Super Bowl Sunday. Whereas our normal has bloom now and the fruits ripe in another month or two. So in Mexico, they love it. They do say that Carmen gives them a great crop whenever the avocado prices are higher because there's no fruit available on other avocados at that time, which is mainly summer, fall, too. So. Do you ever, how do you see an avocado tree that gets all of that input and uh, doesn't ever block it? That's not everything. Well, there's a lot yeah. of those. Huh? There's a lot of those. Oh, you get a lot of those? <laughs> yeah. So some of it, well, okay, so if you grow an avocado from a pit, you never know. It may, well, most pit avocado pits when they're growing they may not flower fruit for 10 years or even more and some may never bloom uh, but there are some varieties like when I was growing up my father planted had he had a forte in the yard and one and that tree was producing pretty well back in the 50s that's all we planted really so he planted another one and the tree was about 15 foot high and wide when we moved out of this was in Pasadena moved to Orange County and it had never flowered. It was that it was big and never, it was a forte. And it came out of moon nursery, though. Not like it. Yeah. It's being recorded, you know. <laughs> so, so anyway. Can I ask you about another variety you have in here after? We'll go over those. Fruit generally doesn't ripen too well on the tree, although sometimes the skin will turn black on the tree, but it doesn't, it usually has to fall off before it gets soft. Most avocados have a five month hang time. And we find, okay, so there's uh, one avocado we, we knew it, it was supposed to be ripe in April. Two avocados fell off in a windstorm on Thanksgiving Day the year before. We said, "Well, these can't be good. It's five months too early." We let we just let them left them in the kitchen, and they were fine. Five months too early, they were fine. So avocados have a longer period than you might think of. Like Cass is supposed to be picked um, February through June, 
But a lot of the supermarkets, those avocados were picked, you know, December and January, and they're 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 not very good, but they're not horrible either. You know, they cheat a lot. But most avocados have a five month hang time. Um, and when so the way you know they're about to fall off, <clears throat> right where the stem attached to the fruit, there's a there's a button there. It's usually green. When it turns yellow, it's ready to fall. So you know to pick it. Yeah, that's right where where it attaches to the fruit. It's like a little green disc that it's smooth green thing that attaches to the fruit. If that thing turns yellow, it's ready you know within a week or two of falling off the tree. <clears throat> Of course, you know, squirrels and rats will get most of your fruit if you leave it on too long. So anyway, Hass and Carmen. So Carmen is a, uh, um, just a weird Hass. But the daughters of Hass are the descendants of Hass. Gwen, Lamb, Jim. A new one just came out called Luna. There's another one out there called Harvest. Uh, and there's another one, oh, well, actually they crossed Hass with Supposedly Mexican types to create surprise. So surprise is also close related to Hass. And that's being sold at the stores this time year as a Hass. Um, also, uh, the one we have called Carmen, not, excuse me, Don Gilligley, which doesn't look like Hass at all. Don Gilligley is a, from a pit of Hass that Don Gilgley planted down in La Jolla uh, 40, 50 years ago, it's shaped like, like this. About that big. Thin skin, uh, really good. We had a, has, a Don Gilgley tree here yesterday. Someone bought it. It had bloomed in December for the April crop, and it was making a whole new set of flowers for an August crop. It was a bigger tree about this size. So this, the Don Giggly is April and August. So two distinct crops on it every year. Um, one of our customers had bought a Don Giggly 30, 25 years ago and he brought us fruit in April and he brought us fruit in August. So we know it does that pretty reliably. And it's a daughter of Hass. It's got great flavor, but it doesn't look anything like a Hass. Yeah. And the fruit almost looks like a little reptilian. So uh, that's another daughter of our close related to these guys. Um, do we have any one of those handouts left? Oh, thank you. Let's see if I'm missing any. So, surprise. I'm trying to see if there's any other Hass relatives on here. So Esther's another one. Um, so Esther is this guy here. So this is uh, a year older than the rest of the trees. And this has, this fruit is supposed to have genetics of Hass and the ball in it. And the ball is a big round avocado. Or you can say it's close related to reed also. Esther. Now, it's also considered very good tasting and ripen summer, fall. So we'll have to wait a few months longer to eat this thing. Um, they said they don't use it commercially because when they were testing it, one crop came out really weird tasting. And they didn't know why that happened. So they weren't going to give that to a farmer and have one crop every so often be a disaster. So but for homeowners, it should be fine. You're not going to lose your house if you don't have one crop one year. So that's an interesting tree, too. And it's it's growing kind of like a reed where it's real narrow and compact. That's near the coast. Is it like cooler? Don't know. That I don't know. Now, reed is better. Well, a lot. Okay, so let's go to the other avocados. So one of our top selling avocados is the reed. 
So there's Nabal. Nabal was, oops, or Nabal, I'm not sure how to pronounce this word. Nabal Nabal was brought from Guatemala. So it's a Guatemalan avocado. Big round fruit with really thick skin. And then Reed is apparently some offspring of Nabal. Similar, not quite as round, not quite as thick as skin. Uh, this is really good tasting. I mean, uh, we heard about it back in the 80s. A uh, local uh, avocado orchard guy told us we grow has to sell, we grow reed to eat. He said a reed is like taking has and pouring bacon grease on it. It's really creamy and it's really good. Um, so reed is, and, and the other thing about reed, it blooms April through June. So it is the last avocado to bloom. Uh, there's no pollinators that bloom at the same time it does, but it's real cell fertile. I mean, if the bees are around, and usually by the coast, it's warm enough to bring the bees out to the, you know, if it's totally fogged in in April or May, and you can't get the bees out to your tree, by June, it's sunnier, and the bees have a better chance. So the reed uh, is better on the coasts than a lot of other avocados are like, they say Hass, well Forte especially, sometimes blooms in the middle of winter. Pinkerton does that too. So uh, when that happens uh, and it's cold that winter, then you don't get a crop. That's one of the reasons we, you know, so there's, well, let's go over these first. And the ball and reed and then esters related to reed. Um, reed is nice because the trees are really tight. They tend to be really compact. And it was a friend of mine that had the reed in the box with 80 fruit on it. So even though reed can grow tall, it makes it such a good fruiter that you can keep it. Like his was only four foot tall in the box and he had 80 fruit. You just keep it cut. And it stays nice and tight. And it'll fruit heavily in that size. Well, it grows that shape. It's a real tight shape, like Christmas tree form. I mean, I've seen reeds do this, though. I, my last house, and I was at a customer's house about five years ago. The reed couldn't figure out where, what was center, so it did this first. It did a spiral, and then it went straight up. And the same thing in my yard. My, my reed went a spiral, and then it started going straight up. It was trying to figure out where, where up was, I guess. But I've seen that in someone's... Yard. It was a 20 foot tall reed, but it was only 8 foot wide. It was, it was a real tight tree. <clears throat> so they're good that way. Nabal can get huge, but again, if Nabal fruits at a small size, just cut it. Just keep it small. They said the problem with Nabal, the skin's so thick it's hard to tell when it's ready to eat. But both reed and Nabal, the skin's so thick that what people do with reeds is they'll cut them in half and then make guacamole and then put them back in the shell you serve it in the shell middle of summer if you expose the branches to sunlight in summer you can burn them so if they've been shaded all year by the foliage above them, then you sun expose them, then they can sunburn. Now you can always just whitewash it. But uh, most avocados, when they're pruned, they're pruned in the winter before the bloom. Well, you haven't spoken about these Mexican varieties. Uh, we'll, we'll get there. <laughs> okay, let's see. Uh, well, the only, the, the Mexican ones we carry are uh, Stewart. and bacon so these are true guatemalans i mean most avocados are hybrids between guatemalans and mexicans oh i spelled that wrong guatemalan oh whatever the ball is true guatemalan reed is, is most is pretty much guatemalan it acts like guatemalan um these are mexican
There's one called Jim. Jim Bacon, in, who is in Buena, lived in Buena Park, created Bacon first, and another one called Jim. I guess he liked his name. So, uh, uh, Bacon is certainly a good producer around here. The fruit is the oil content's low. Well, it's not that low. Um, now, the book says you can pick this October through March. I don't think it's any good before January. Before January, this is like water. But after January starts, it's pretty good. I like it. I like it. I, I think it's got a sweeter flavor than some avocados eat because most avocados have very, very little sugar in them. Stewart is is like the true Mexicolas. They're smaller fruit. This is a fairly big fruit. Stewart's are smaller fruit, um, real thin black skin, um, and they ripen five months after they bloom. So most avocados are a year or more. It takes for the flower to make it to ripe. Stewart, uh, October. The same year it blooms in October, you can pick that thing. Because of that, they're smaller. They don't have time to get size, but they're quite good. Yeah, it's enough for one person. Yeah. Steward can get big bacon, medium size, but again, if they can fruit at a smaller size, uh, you can just keep them cut. So, so those are the true Mexicans and the true Guatemalans. Now, Fuerte talk about Forte a bit. Forte is uh, was brought from Mexico and Forte is mostly Mexican. It was the first avocado really well okay they said it survived a nasty frost in the early 1900s. I don't know how cold that one got but they said the Forte survived it in Altadena passing area where it was introduced. So forte means strong, and that was for against the cold. Uh, the problem with forte is it blooms really early, and in orchards, what they're saying is that 20% of the trees in the orchard do all the fruiting, and 8% just sit there. Now this was written about 30 years ago. They said that, and what they've said recently is that what's appearing to be is that the warmer parts of the orchard are the only places where the trees are getting pollinated by the bees. So that's the problem. They bloom too early. If they bloom in the middle of winter, they're not getting pollinated. They don't make much fruit. Um, some of them, for some reason, bloom later and they get better pollination, but parts of the orchard that were in warmer spots were doing a lot better. So there may not be much wrong with Forte, but it does have that problem with the early bloom. We noticed that Pinkerton, same problem. I've had Pinkerton blooming in December, and back in the late 80s when we had really cold winters, there was just no sign of any bees. And I sat there and watched this tree for about five years. I said, this isn't worth it. I got no fruit forming on this tree at all. So with Pinkerton, uh, lately, the weather has been a lot warmer. <clears throat> um, and Pinkerton has, well, if you live in San Diego County, Pinkerton is great. Or if we have, like 10 years ago, we had no winters. And Pinkerton was doing really good. So it just goes back and forth. But this thing does bloom early, and that blooms early too. So that potentially is a problem. Now, bacon blooms early, but bacon usually sets fruit really well. So it's a little little con little uh, confusing there okay adrenal <clears throat> the guy's name was ed i guess his first name was adrenal is that a name anyway uh this was developed or found in southern california and it and it's I don't carry many of them because it's just an oddball that no one really knows much about. It does make really good fruit. What's interesting about it is the tree is really vigorous but doesn't grow big. So whenever we grow adrenal, we can tell it from distance because the leaves are huge. The stems are really strong and the plant grows straight up. 
but they said the original tree never really got much higher than say 18 foot so it's it doesn't tend to want to grow big but it fruits well too the fruits are large the fruits for us are about so on our second year uh, edronol about this big we had four fruits that were really big um, and they were really good so no problem with the fruit quality on edronol but it is an oddball This is a recent walk-in, and let's see. Okay, so the other unique ones, uh, Charwell. So Charwell, and then you have Jan Boys. So I'll put them up over here. So at the field station, those are the top two tasting. Jan Boys number one, Charwell number two, as far as tasting avocados now. I've eaten these, and I've eaten all the other, most of the avocados, not all of them, but I've eaten most of them. It's not a huge difference. I would tell you, you know, if you grow an avocado and you pick it at the right time, it's way better than anything in the stores nowadays. It's like, the stuff at the stores, I don't know, who's, who's processing them? But they're either sitting them out in the sun all day, or I don't know what's going on. Now, they say when they come up from Mexico, they're in that truck for a couple of weeks. So that can be a problem. So, um, <laughs> yes. Um, okay, so Charwell was, was uh, found in Australia quite a while ago. Uh, it may be a daughter for it. We're not sure of the genetics of it. Uh, it was taken to Hawaii, Kona, Hawaii, so it picked up the name, and some people call it Kona Sharwell, but it's actually just Sharwell. And then it was bought to California. The Kona Sharwell was bought to California. Um, so it is considered one of the top avocados. It's got a super long hang time. They said you can pick it for about a 10 month period, not five, but 10 months from March to January the next year is its, if it's, is its harvest period. They say it's best between April and August, but uh, it's got a really long hang time. Uh, the trees tend to be short. I have one in my house that's never gotten a much higher than two feet. Uh, it'd be on the ground if it wasn't a pot. I mean, it just has never grown. It makes fruit, but doesn't grow. Um, now, when it got to Hawaii, the University of Hawaii said, well, this isn't as heavy producers we'd like it to be. So they took a whole bunch of seedlings of Charwell and from that they got one called Green Gold. Now in Hawaii they say Green Gold tastes better than Charwell. We're not sure in California if it's got, you know in California it's not doesn't have that reputation of being better than Charwell uh, locally but it's still really good. But they say it's a better producer in Charles, so we're that's why we got it this year. We want to see how how it compares. All that. Well, when you grow them from seed, they come up anything. Yeah. Now, Jan Boyce <clears throat> is considered number one in flavor, so we brought that one this year to see how you know the first. This is the first time we've had a lot of Jan Boyce. So I'll bring that in. They say it's an open tree that's a bit larger. Okay, then we also have Queen. And Queen is the largest of the good quality. You know, there's a lot of big avocados out there, but a lot of the real big ones are like water. They don't have much flavor, but Queen is still considered excellent. And it's a two pounder, up over two pounds even. And it's supposed to have a small seed on top of that. So we'll try the queen. Um, now, queen, when we've grown it, it tends to grow faster than, same with fuerte, the trees tend to grow straight up faster. So we know they want to be bigger trees. Um, the queens also tend to be a little less vigorous 
they tend to be a little weaker. So we've lost a lot of queens over the years. For some reason, they're just not as sturdy as my other avocado trees. Even though they grow fast, we lose a lot of them. So we're not sure what's going on with queen. If it's something to do with the seed, rootstock, or what's going on with them. So, But if you want the biggest, excellent avocado you can have, that, that's it. I think I got all of them. Any questions? Well, you can always get cold enough there to kill any avocado. I mean, 1990 was the record cold for California. In 1990, December, we hit here 23 degrees. And that would have killed anything smaller than this. It would have killed it. Uh, and in Northern California, I know San Francisco, they said they hit 18. I can mem um, I think Sacramento did 13. It's like, you're going to lose the tree unless you have it protected. So, I mean, the strongest of these is the Stewart. Stewart is the most cold hardy. Bacon is close. <clears throat> yeah, um, surprise, they thought because it's mostly Mexican, it's going to be was going to be as strong, but it's not. There's Mexico. <clears throat> Mexico is a true Mexican, so it'd be. <clears throat> but I don't know how cold they can go. I mean, of course, I had a Mexico one that hit 23, and I didn't get any damage on it. But we lost uh, Whitzel and Gwen. They just froze to the dirt in 1990. So, <clears throat> so yeah, we can always get those again. Now, the other thing that I was telling, I have some customers in Arizona and Menifee and those areas that came and bought avocados, and we're talking about how to protect them. Now, what they're doing in Florida, <clears throat> which you can't quite do in uh, for avocados, they have... Uh, citrus orchards totally enclosed in a fine mesh and that would uh, you know if you cover something you're going to insulate it slightly so it's not going to be quite as hot underneath not quite as cold underneath and that may be good enough you can't have any sides on like the orchards and they're doing the citrus they cover the sides too so nothing can get in because citrus don't need bees but avocados need the bees so you have to leave the sides open but just of course when it's cold night you can close them and keep it protected that way a little bit. But what they found is underneath that <clears throat> fine screening, which is actually a bug screen, not a shade cloth, but it does cut down the sunlight about 10%. <clears throat> they said they're getting better production on that in those orchards than they are in full sun. <clears throat> they said that what's happening, <clears throat> even though they're <clears throat> excuse me, cutting down <clears throat> the sunlight just a little bit, <clears throat> It's refracting on the back sides of the trees. <clears throat> so they think they're getting better production on the north sides of the trees than without the screen. So the screen material is reflecting light just a little bit more to the north side. So that's an option for people who live in colder climates is to cover the trees permanently, leave the sides open, well, and then... <clears throat> And then, and then, and then, even close them on cold nights, just to keep the warmer air in there. So that may be good enough. That they make a, I know they they've sent us emails. The university sent us emails on what screening material this is. I have it somewhere in my files, but the farm supply should know what that is. It's, so it's a real fine mesh that won't let bugs in, doesn't block as much sunlight as the shade cloth does. <clears throat> Okay, yes. I'm not a grafter. Now, if you graft an avocado tree outside, because like these are grafted indoors and they can do it anytime they want. <clears throat> but outside, I've met a grafter who did specialize in avocado. He says they always do it in Orange County in May. It's got to be warm enough to do it outside in May. Uh, but if you have a greenhouse, you can you can graft these any time you want. So. <clears throat> yeah, there's an organization in Orange County, the Orange County chapter of the California Rare Fruit Growers, 
and there's a lot of people, members of that, that are really good at grafting. So I'm going. I'm better at growing and selling. I'm not as good at grafting. Yeah, so one of my friends bought a bunch of these and he's going to grow them. His wife doesn't want any more fruit trees, so he's just when they get big enough to graft, he's just going to graft them onto his main tree. <laughs> he's going to have a salad. Yeah, right. Okay, I think that's it. Thank you. I've got one pot here if someone needs a clean pot. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.